Hello, I am Harvey Ambrose, and I am preaching this message today on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio program broadcast out of uh, Monrovia, Liberia. And to uh, my listeners there who I try to pray for, and ask that they pray for me. The lesson today is a continuation in our study of the book of Genesis. And we begin uh, in chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. And I'll read it in its entirety. It's hard to read and, and lengthy, but I think that's the best way to get through it. And again, pray for me as I try to preach. Genesis chapter 14. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eleazar, Tetelaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, and Shem Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of uh, Bela, which is Zoar. <clears throat> All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Chedorlaomer and his kings that were with him, and smote the Raphaims in Ashtaroth, Carnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Sheba, Hirathamim, uh, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Enmashpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazotamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddam. With Ketorleomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and with Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddam was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals, and they went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. And there came one that escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, or blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, 
and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion the men that went, uh, which went with me, Aner, and Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. And with many mistakes that I've made, um, that is Genesis chapter 14. Sorry about the pronunciations. I said I tried to practice saying Kedleomer, which I think is how it should be done. But all that falls by the wayside when you're under the gun. As Abraham found himself, well, had they had guns back then, under the gun. He was under pressure. And since I've tried to frame uh, the relevance of Abraham's life uh, to our lives today, nearly 4,000 years later, in what seems to be a completely different world to some, but yet human nature seeming to be identical today is what it was then. I refer back over and again to Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 51, where she says, Ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock from whence you are hewn, and to the pit of the hole from which you are digged, look unto Abraham your father. Reference of that is that Abraham is uh, said to be the, uh, said by God to be the father of the faithful, not that he's a father uh, in the sense of uh, a physical DNA, nor that he's the father of the faithful in so much that he gave them spiritual life, because those things belong to God himself. But as the person whom God picked amongst the people of this earth to bring his son, Jesus Christ, into the earth so that all the nations of the earth could be blessed with the salvation that comes from one source only, Christ. And it comes through by the grace of God through faith. Or I think it's a better term so that we understand it better. It can mean the same thing. Trust. Having trust. Complete trust that ultimately in Jesus, that we are saved from even a worse faith that we find Lot in here in Genesis 14. Now, not, not trying to pick up that reading again or, or pick to pieces of the things that are brought there, there's just a few things that I want to, uh, to mention. So, we read in the last chapter how that, uh, I think it was there, yeah, that Abram and Lot, who had been together all the way back to Ur of the Chaldees, had not been separated. They were uncle uh, and nephew, that's Abram and Lot, Abram being the uncle. Uh, apparently, Lot's father, Haran, who died in Ur of the Chaldees, had been very close to Abram. They named a town after Haran. Uh, where they stopped at the midway point of where God told them to go. Maybe not known that that was the midway point, but that's where they stopped until Abram's father died. And yet Lot continued with them into the land where God showed him it would be his and his posterity and that he would, uh, he would give it to them. And uh, they went to Egypt and got in some trouble, but they also got rich. They may have already been rich to start with, but they were much richer still, if I understand the reading, by the gifts of Pharaoh to them. Came back into the land of Canaan, and their riches brought about a separation. Uh, they were they herded animals, they were 
husbandmen of various types of cattle which had to graze. Presumably, uh, this was the reason for discontent or malcontent between uh, those who herded the animals belonging to Abram and those who herded the animals belonging to Lot. And rather than have this uh, strife go on between people who had been so close and were related by blood, Abram uh, asked that Lot would separate, but gave him the choice of whatever he wanted. And Lot chose uh, chose Sodom. It says he lifted up his eyes and to the cities, you know, there along the uh, the southern end of the uh, Jordan River. They called it the cities of the plain. And I saw that it was well watered, very desirable looking, and he chose it despite a knowledge. No doubt that he had, uh, because it's mentioned here in uh, chapter 13, not that, not, not that it says Lot knew it, but it seemed to be a common knowledge. Verse 13 of chapter 13 says, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, I guess that's the first point. We need to be careful about the choices that we make. Particularly things, I'm not talking about what we eat for dinner. I'm not talking about what, you know, whatever. Little things that are trivial. But in terms of where you live, particularly if you're going to be separating from family, uh, we need to be prayerful that the Lord uh, does not lead us into temptation uh, and that he delivers us from evil and that our choices are consistent with his will. We should pray that the Lord give us, uh, you know, give us, if not a direction of where to go, at least he understands that, that we are depending upon him for guidance so that where we go is in accordance with his will and not something uh, that could tend towards our harm or towards harming the relationship if we're saved or hope to be saved, if we're following after righteousness, if we are seeking the Lord, as we read Isaiah 51, certainly not something that would distance us from God or cause us to offend or the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, as Melchizedek pointed out. So apparently Lot may not have consulted or didn't care. He liked what his eyes saw. Now we know that Lot was a righteous man. We're re we read that in either first or second Peter. And uh, so he was saved. I can't take anything from that. But as a saved person, I've made errors. I've made errors with respect to the Lord. And I think Lot made an error. And I think this error cost him. And the first time that we see it costing him is, is here. When he first left Abraham, it says he pitched tents towards Sodom. In other words, he, he moved that direction. And if we take that to a, uh, a spiritual, but I mean really quite practical level and try to take it as a lesson to us, I think we all know that when, uh, when people toy around with, with sin, with with doing something that we've not done, we know it's wrong to do, and we perhaps yet want something that's associated with that area or that place or those people or that crowd or that activity, whatever it may be that, that we know is not right. And we, we tell ourselves that, well, I can take of it that which I want, but not get myself completely involved in it. So, I mean, in this example, perhaps Lot wanted uh, some of the ground to graze on that was very close to Sodom. So he, he went towards Sodom, towards that greener pasture, that, that more profitable land, perhaps. I don't know that, but it, it fits with human desire and human nature. Thinking as a righteous man, he would, he would not fall prey uh, to to succumbing or, or becoming like the men which he knew 
were exceedingly sinful before the Lord. He wanted to be close to them and not beyond them. But if we read what we just read in chapter 14, we now read that Lot was in Sodom. He was in Sodom. He was living in Sodom. He didn't, he wasn't just toward Sodom. He was altogether in Sodom, which I think is typical of how those of us who think we can be close to sin and yet not fall into sin or sinful behaviors or sinful companionships or whatever. We want to be uh, very much in the world and think ourselves not of it. But it all depends on where your heart is and what your motivations are that you start flirting around with ungodliness. And ungodliness is, is in all people. There's, there's no question it's, it, it, you know, say people are yet in the flesh and, that, and, and, and Paul the apostle says of his flesh that in his flesh dwelleth no good thing, nothing good about the flesh. Don't have time to preach that sermon, but, but the, the, the true nature of the children of God while they're here in this world is that their bodies are yet sinful and their relationship to God is in the spirit, in the heart, not in the flesh. That doesn't mean that we are not uh, taught by God to, to restrain sinful urges and to buffet our body daily to keep it under subjection to God and that we are to strive for godliness with all that we've got. But, but we never got saved by doing those things. We cannot keep ourselves saved by doing those things. We were saved by God himself and we are kept saved by God himself. And yet it displeases God when we sin. And in our love for God, because of the sins he's forgiven us, we feel a... Uh, an earnest desire to not offend him. It seems the least we could do, but it's hard. And so as we flirt around with this world, which I don't know about Liberia and, and the nations around it. I, I've not been there in a long time, probably 40 years. Yeah, about that. But, but in this country, the people of the United States of America, not all of them, there surely are some righteous people here, as Lot was a righteous man living in Sodom, yet by and large, it would appear that even in my lifetime, which is tiny in the scheme of things, this nation has become so degenerated and so exceedingly sinful in the face of God, as though we were casting our sins right in front of his face and, and proud of it. We, 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 we brag about how proud we are, having no thought that God resists the proud and that his grace only goes to those who are humble. What is wrong with a nation that boasts of its sinfulness and that, and that tries to export its degenerate sinfulness to the world as though we have created virtue which had formerly been and yet remains complete sinfulness. Is America exceedingly sinful in the eyes of God? Well, we do everything that Sodom and Gomorrah was written of saying that they did, and then some. I can't help but believe that, that the days of this nation are numbered, that we have indeed been weighed in the ballots, in God's ballots, and found wanting. It's hard for me to, to believe that if, uh, that if uh, Capernaum 
would see uh, Sodom and Gomorrah rise up in judgment against them and condemn them because had the mighty works that were done in Capernaum been done in Sodom, Jesus said it would have remained to that day. In other words, that the Sodomites were more righteous than the Jews of, of Jesus' time that were living in Galilee. How much more so? A nation is set with, that we say is under God, that we say was founded by those seeking God, that has now gone completely the other direction. How much more so will Sodom and Gomorrah, which we read about here in chapter 14, rise up in the judgment against us and, and condemn us who had so much more light. As far as we know, the, the, only, the only spiritual guidance they had was Lot. And yet we have a book that teaches us about God who became human so that he could make manifest the nature of God in, in a human form that we could see. And if we can't see him with our eyes, we can read about him and, and understand how, how good he was to us. How holy he was. How selfless he was. How filled with love he was. How compassionate he was and remained so to the children of men and how he uh, gave all that he had and he, he was poured out like water so that we might be saved. We know this today so much more than the Sodomites and those of Gomorrah. And yet as a nation, sinful. God judges such nations. And if he's consistent, and God is consistent, it's only a matter of time for us. I'm sidetracked there. But anyway, Lot was in Sodom now. And what we have here is a, an account, the first account in Scripture of a war. And that's not to say there wasn't war before then. In fact, we can almost assume there was. Some 600 years before this time, God destroyed the world, and at least in part because it says uh, the whole world was filled with violence. Well, if the whole world is full of violence, it sounds like there were some wars going on. But the account given here, this war between nine nations, nine kings, four against five, it's given here for one reason only. Well, <laughs> more than one, I guess. But in the first place, because it involved and concerned Abram, who we are to look to, if we are seeking, if we are, are pursuing righteousness and seeking the Lord. So we're looking to what he does under these circumstances. And it involved Lot, whose end was less than so good, at least as far as this world is concerned. And yet both men righteous. And it shows that there's a way to live as a child of God. And there's a way to, to shun living as a child of God. And, and, and every, every saved person, and, and I'm not going to say fake saved or, or, or some other thing which isn't saved, but truly saved, those who, who God has given new life to in the heart, those who are new creatures in Christ, born again of his spirit, totally saved, saved to the uttermost by the one Savior of men, Jesus Christ. Those of us have yet to look to Abram and his circumstances to find out what, how we ought to live and how we ought not to live as emissaries, if you will, or examples 
of God's kingdom before men who, who look to us, whether they know it or not, whether we know it or not, they are looking upon those who, who are God's people and saying, well, they're judging. As they have a right to do when they see us doing things that, that they do, that they know are wrong. Surely we would know that too. But anyway, falling off track. Here's the world. The first war in the world mentioned in the Bible. And it would seem that Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities uh, of, the, uh, of that region, which were the cities of the plain, which is where the Dead Sea now is. And yet I don't believe it was there at that time. I believe the Dead Sea is there because of the destruction that later came upon these cities in which God sent fire from heaven and burned a hole in the ground, literally burned the earth up so far down that it's the lowest spot on the surface of the planet to this day. And that the Jordan, such a, a life-giving river and so, so well storied in the Bible, falls down to its death when it gets to where Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain were, it becomes the Salt Sea. It's mentioned as the Salt Sea here, as a place name, but it did not exist, I don't believe, as a salt sea, but rather a well-watered plain before God judged it, which he did subsequently to this war. Now these kings, the living there, of these cities that were located there had been under, uh, they were vassals, if you will, of other, of other countries particularly Ketelaomer, which was the king of nothing less than what became modern day Babylon. Well, not modern day, but later Babylon the Great. And also of Elam, which Persia, these are major countries. What became the, some of the first of the huge kingdoms of the world, even seen by Daniel in prophecy. And these little tiny cities and this well-watered plain, having given themselves so over to sin, exceedingly sinful before God, did not see fit. In other words, there, it's as though he gave them a spirit of blindness and, and they could not understand the peril that they would be in if they rebelled. Because being subject to those crowns, those, those kings up there, those powerful countries, they had to pay tribute to them. They, nobody likes taxes. It's like a tax. These big countries would leave them alone if they gave tribute to them. Well, they did. I think it tells us for, for, 12, for 13 years. Uh, in 12, they did it for 12 years. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. They stopped paying their tribute. So the very next year, the 14th year, down come these kings, these four kings from those powerful nations to subdue them. And they came. They started way up north of Damascus, way up north towards the Euphrates River, maybe even from Euphrates, and started working their way down the east side of the Jordan River. You know, it tells where they went. If you follow it on a map, and you can find the cities, they went down the east side of the Jordan River, parallel to that river, and they didn't just tear up those cities, but lots of them. They just started spoiling everything in sight. And then they, they got all the way down and, and hooked around towards the Mediterranean, going west now of the Jordan, southwest of what is now the Dead Sea, and attacked Kadesh Barnea, it says here Kadesh, and then turn back up to the northeast from where they reached and hit the, the object of their mission, which was the cities of the plain. And they, and they destroyed the cities. And they took captive the people and the property. They, they stole everything, not just of those cities, but I'm sure they ransacked every city they went to. And it says that in this battle, there was slime pits, and that's tar. There was apparently a lot of patrolling in that area until a lot of it probably got burned up when the fire from heaven came, even though there's yet some, some evidence of little bits of partially burned tar there. But uh, 
in those slime pits, people that were trying to flee from them as the tide of battle turned strongly against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, uh, many of them probably died, I guess. They fell there. And so there were slime pits. And But in any event, apparently the king of Sodom survived and some others were able to flee away because he, the king of Sodom, comes up to Abraham after it's all over. Now, Abraham here, or Abram, hears about it through someone who survived the battle. And when he found out that Lot was taken, Abram decides what to do. Now, Jesus says, blessed be the peacemakers. And I believe that. I can remember when I was a young person, a lost person, an army officer in the Army of the United States of America, I, I deplored the fact that even though I had been on active duty during a couple of wars, I had never been able to get into war. I wanted combat, yet it was not my lot to be sent into combat, though I volunteered. It didn't happen. And then I got saved. And then I was glad that God had spared me combat. People think it's a glorious thing. It's a deadly thing. It's a bloody thing. It's, it can bring about uh, memories of terrible things that, that you don't ever want to think about, but you can't stop thinking about it if you've been involved in it. I think it's hurtful to the heart. I'm not saying it's wrong. Abraham did it and God blessed him for it. It depends upon what the war is for. It's easy to say, well, my country called me. But there's been many a country that called people and the country that called them was wrong. You know, we had World War I where, you know, the allied nations said, oh, we're, we're on the side of God. You know, we've got to do this because we're right. And, and the Germans and the Austrians, they're, they're all wrong. And yet the Germans and the Austrians had belt buckles that said, Gott mit uns, or God with us. Another name for Emmanuel. It's as though they had a title for Jesus on their belt buckles. They firmly believed that God was on their side. Uh, here in my country, uh, my, Truly, my country would be the Southern Confederacy that, that fought against the United States government when that government came down and attacked us. We didn't want to be allied with them anymore. Didn't think we had any constitutional reason to be. But we had no choice but to fight when they show up on our doorstep. Kind of like what happened to these people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and we lost. And it had a big price to pay in blood and in property, and in prestige, and in every, every way. It's, it's, it's a bad thing to be in a war. It's a worse thing to lose a war, as these kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities had done. But Abram did not enter it out of patriotism. Abram did not enter it uh, in order to make money, or to gain glory, or any such thing. His his only thought was his nephew, which here it says his brother. It's as though he's a replacement for the brother that he loved who had died. This shows how Abram's heart was towards Lot. He loved him as though he was his own brother. And he must have loved that brother very much. He deplored, no doubt, their separation. And he went after him. And he went after him with what he had, which teaches us that it is okay to, to defend yourself. And if not yourself, if your family has been attacked, it's okay to, to do what must be done. If you can do it, you ought to do it. And you ought to be ready to do it. Abram was ready. He had trained people in his household, people he could trust, who were born into his household. He had servants. He didn't have any children of his own. But he had servants that had children, he had servants that loved him and, and had children and, and they were all born into his household and he trained them. No doubt he trained them in the ways of God, but he also probably trained them in the ways of war to be able to handle the weapons of that time so that should the need arise, they were ready. He did not hesitate. 
He did not think, well, what's going to happen if I do this? You know, is it going to cost me? If your heart's right, I, I don't doubt but what he prayed. But we don't read that. We won't, we don't know that. If he prayed and got an answer, my assumption is God said, go and get him. But we don't know that. All we know is it sounds like in haste, he got his servants together and he pursued these, with 318 people, he pursued the armies of four major kingdoms. It made no difference to him what the, what the odds were. He had, a, he had a love relationship with his nephew and, 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 his, and his grand nieces, no doubt, through there. He, he loved his brethren and he, and he would risk it all because life in this world wasn't all that important to him other than the parts of it that mattered, which is love. And for the sake of love, which is, if you really have that in a war, that is certainly one of, if not the only justifiable reasons to engage in one. And he went and he slaughtered those people. We don't read that he killed them all, but he took back everything they took, every possession they took, every person they took, and he smote them and he chased them. It looks like he went somewhere between uh, like 100 and 120 miles northeast of where he dwelt. We don't know exactly where in memory he was. But he chased them out of the country, way up to the northeast past Damascus, to the west of Damascus, if I understand left from his context. So he prevailed for all the Sodomites and Gomorrahites and other ites from that Place full of wicked men, and we know what their wickedness was, at least in one part, because we, we still use the term. And we can imagine what type of army they assembled. And I'll bet you they thought they were something else. But they fell miserably before an army come from another nation that perhaps was not that way. But Abraham routed that nation. There's no doubt that Melchizedek, when he came out, offering bread and wine and saying, blessed be Abraham, servant of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And then he said, and blessed be the most high God who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. So there's no doubt that God was the one who, who blessed the 300 and what was it? I you know, always forget things like this. He says, uh, I think it's three, yeah, 318 against a multitude, no doubt, thousands of soldiers that were well-trained and that was their job. Yet God could overcome that when he's invested in a battle. And here he was invested because he loved his servant, Abraham. And Lot was righteous and he loved Lot. So that would also teach those of you who are against God's people, you, you may not know who they are. It, you can't look at them and tell. So it's better to be nice to all people because God will not hold you guiltless when you persecuted his people. That's in the Bible too. And not that his people are asking for retribution. But God himself preserves vengeance against those that would hurt his folks. About out of time, I've spent too long on other things, but there's a, uh, this thing about Melchizedek, I'll just tell you without explanation, there's a, there's a description of a, uh, Melchizedek, which leaves no doubt to an unprejudiced mind that it could be nothing other, that, that Melchizedek was nothing other than Jesus Christ before he was made flesh. So in other words, the word of God is described in John chapter one, who was in the world, we read in John chapter one, but the world did not know him in chapter one. Then he became flesh and dwelt among men. 
and went unto his own, meaning the Jews, and his own received him not. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as Isaiah 53 says, this was the one who came to Abraham after the slaughter of the kings and blessed him and said, and blessed be the God, the most high possessor of heaven and earth who had delivered thine enemies into thy hand. In other words, <laughs> he just comes out of nowhere. His name, Melchizedek, it means two things. It means, uh, well, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And since he was the king of Salem, Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem means peace. So he that is king of righteousness and king of peace. What mere human would allow, that was the priest of the most high God, would allow himself to be called something that belongs to the Lord. Because the Lord is the one that is the, as he became incarnate, became the son of God in the flesh, he became the prince of peace. So, and certainly the prince of righteousness. The righteous one and only one of Israel. This was Jesus Christ in what is called a, a Christophany, a, an appearance that, in which he was able to appear to men like he did in the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not cast three into the furnace? But I see, I see four. And, and, and the fourth one is like it to the Son of God. Many times did Christ Come, he says, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, it says, and the word of the Lord came to Samuel and stood over him as he slept and said, Samuel, Samuel. And John tells us in John chapter word, one that uh, the word in the beginning was in the beginning with God and was God and that all things were made by him and nothing that was made was made without him. I know I'm misquoting it, but later the word became flesh. This was the word of God before he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He came out and he blessed him. And every time you get blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives you something. It wasn't just bread and wine. He taught Abraham how to describe God. Because he said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And then the next thing you know, when Abram is discussing giving things or taking things from the king of Sodom, Abram says, I have now lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Language like that, so that we understand who it is that we make our prayers to. The Most High, who owns all that there is. And we're nothing before Him. And all the doings of the world are, are just a, a tick of time and it's gone. Uh, grass that appears and then withers. It's, it's, a, it's a vapor that's here and, and, dis, and gone. The, the whole history of the human race is less than 6,000 years old or about that. And it may be ending soon. How does that compare to timelessness that lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? With no end, and in terms of Christ, no beginning, no end, no mother, no father, no, no end of days or beginning of life. This Melchizedek that blessed the greatest of the great, as far as men are concerned, our father Abraham, if we're saved. <laughs> and he says, when that king of Sodom says, oh, you take all the goods, just give me the people. He says, no, sir, no. He didn't say, he didn't accuse him, though he knew it was true, that you're the king of a city that was exceedingly sinful right in the face of God. I'm not going to take anything from you. 
regardless. If, if it were millions of dollars in today's money or billions, I'm not going to take a shoe latchet. I'm not going to take anything so that you could say, oh, well, yeah, he, he's a righteous man, but you know, he got his start for me or he wouldn't have got there if it wouldn't be for my help. See, we don't want to ever give occasion to the sinners of this world to say, well, they may say, I knew him before. And they'd be right about that. Those who knew me before would have plenty to talk about. Plenty. To my shame. Even things since I was saved. But we should not give them any more <laughs> than, than our weakness we do to give occasion to them to to claim some part of us as children of God that they brought to pass. Abram wouldn't do it. And we should not either. If we're looking to him to see how to act, Abram stayed away from those folks. He saved them because of Lot. But he, didn't want to, he did not want any benefit from it. That was not his reason for going. He captured great spoils and great people, he could have, they were his by conquest if he wanted them. Even if he didn't, well, I mean, they were his. To do with as he chose, including a lot. He said, no, I won't take any of it. That's not, he didn't say it, but not why he went. He went out of love and out of kindness, out of neighborliness to do what needed to be done against some ruthless people who came and made war on the neighborhood in which he lived. Those who were with him, that lived in memory with him, he said, if they want to share, they can have at it. But as for me, I'll take nothing from you, king of Sodom. I've got no business with you. Then he went back doing what he had done before the war. So the people of God can engage in this world at that level. If it's a will of God, if it makes sense, if it's for love, if it's for defense, truly defense, not just what people call defense, there'd be no taint on them for that. But it shouldn't be after bloodlust or fame, or even thanks. We don't read that Abram wanted anything from it other than to save Lot. That's how we ought to be. Went a little bit long. God bless you. My prayer. Goodbye.